This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. And thank you for joining us today. With me today is my co-host Richard Fields. Richard, I was hoping you could help me understand this whole FBI Michael Flynn madness. I mean, from a civil libertarian perspective, we kind of understand how it works, but maybe you can help me understand how this whole thing is taking place because I'm hearing two different stories from the left. You're hearing that, you know, the Trump administration is violating the oath of their office and the oath of the justice department. And then you have the, the political right and the civil libertarians actually saying this whole FBI thing has been a massive abuse of power. So can you help us understand that a little bit? Perjury trap. <laughs> that's in, simple. In, that's in, in very simple language. That's what, that's what Michael Flynn got caught in. And the way of perjury is a standard uh, interrog and, and interrogatory uh, technique by the FBI. They'll have two agents in a room with uh, with one interviewee, uh, Flynn being the guy that's being interviewed. Two agents. They don't tape the the meeting, so it's you know each FBI agent backing up the other story, their word against the uh, the subject, and they'll start the thing off with a kind of an innocuous uh, conversation about you know sure it's nice to see you. You know, uh, let's say it's at, at the guy's home, beautiful home you've got here, great neighborhood. You must be nice to have uh, to live in this great neighborhood with a loving wife. And if you say yes, and they know that you're in divorce proceedings, you've just lied to the FBI. Once you lied to the FBI, which is federal crime, they've got you by the short hairs. They can pretty much uh, coerce you into testifying however they want you to testify against whoever they want testified against under a uh, dagger of a, of a huge uh, prison sentence hanging over you for lying to the FBI. That's what happened to James Flynn. Now, whether he had anything to say that would have been uh, harmful to the Trump administration, I have no idea. And I don't think anybody really does, but that's, that's, why, that, that's what he was indicted on, uh, conniving among the uh, FBI agents to set a, a perjury trap came to light with the uh, uncovering of some documents. And that's why Barr said, hey, we can't go forward with this. This is a no-go. Yeah, which so makes the libertarians are right. Trump is, you know, is, is a very wrong precedent, but going after him in this particular way, you know, just goes against everything to do with the uh, due process of, process of law, a fair and just way of uh, proceeding in the, in the courts and everything that we uh, hold dear is in the separation of powers. Yeah, because we now can't know, right? We have no idea if if Flynn is a criminal. Actually, there was something he was covering up, or if the FBI was just going rogue. Because as average citizens sitting three thousand miles away, we have no way of knowing because the F our trust in the FBI in the process is now gone, and we've never trusted Trump. So, what's the average person supposed to do? <laughs> Trump has plenty of things that he can be attacked upon just on the issues whether we go into all of his personal uh, peccadillos or whether we go into all of his uh, grandstanding on Twitter, all the rest of it is kind of kind of uh, beside the point. We can go after him because he's bad on immigration, he's bad on trade, uh, he's bad on expanding the federal debt, he's ban bad on pressuring the Fed to pursue uh, just irresponsible monetary policy. He's bad in many, many different ways. He's good on a few things, but a whole lot of things he's terrible yeah and so we're left with trying to figure out the rule of law is supposed to apply to our government just as much as it applies to us that was kind of the difference in the united states and everybody else because for throughout history the average citizen has always been held to the rule of law right it's whatever the law is the average citizen is held to it the united states is supposed to be different because the government and its agents were supposed to be held to the same standard and as we're watching now the fbi can lie to you set you up in a perjury trap but yet all they have to do is threaten you with your child getting run through the same process and so you you know plead guilty yeah i mean it, that's that's the, the the irony of the whole thing the fbi can legally lie to you through its teeth and they do but if you lie to them it's a crime so our government can lie to us and politicians do it whenever they open their mouth if we lie to the fbi we're we're hung out to dry that's that's the the irony and the the tragedy of the whole situation yeah, I don't even understand why anybody would even talk to the FBI at this point. Why would you even let them in your... No, I'm going to get a lawyer and then we can sit down and have a conversation if you really need to. I just... Yeah, not, not an advisable thing to do if you're in any way 
uh, close to any kind of criminal or uh, dangerous investigation, unless you have an attorney present, of course. Yeah, it just it makes no sense because the FBI is proven. I mean, because we've known like the FBI crime lab has been proven to be what so we say corruptible. Um, agents have been proven to be corruptible and they'll, they're more interested in getting a conviction than they are in serving justice. That's what we've seen. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to impugn the average FBI agent in general. I mean, you know, they, they're probably, uh, you know, honest, upward, you know, outstanding citizens trying to do their job, but they have the cards, the, the deck is stacked against the people who they're going after. They've got uh, the weight of the federal government against us with uh, essentially uh, very little uh, protection, and that's that's uh, that's a bad situation. Yeah, and we know how yeah, it, uh, it, can, it can go after the rich and powerful, or, or a general like Flynn. Consider how bad we would be in the same situation. How bad off we would be. Yeah, we have no choice, and and as we've seen that a, a corruptible, a uncorruptible person can still be influenced by a system that is fundamentally corrupted. Right? You, you don't even have to. You can be thinking you're doing the right thing, like our drug laws. Right. You can be genuinely believing you're doing the right thing, but ultimately your enforcement of those drug laws is immoral. Throwing somebody in a cage because they decided to smoke pot is fundamentally immoral. But yet they believe they were doing the right thing. And so a corrupted system can corrupt a honest, honorable person. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing here is we got a bunch of people who are honorable, you know, maybe believing they're doing the right thing, believing they're trying to save the country but they've gone way off the tracks, way off the rails in accomplishing their goals. And so, which brings us to our next topic here, which I've actually lost. <laughs> ah, California's looming budget disasters talk about corruptible organizations. Um, Governor Newsom the other day put said he was 54.3, I think it was, billion dollar budget deficit, which is a best guess on, at its best, you know, during this time. But it's yeah, kind of that's, that's called pulling it out of your rear end, actually. Yeah, I'm not sure how they came up with that number. You can kind of hope they're on the on the conservative side. You know, they're it's bigger than it is going to be. But what do you think about this kind of? Well, you know, I mean, basically? California is one of the worst states. I mean, the unemployment compensation fund has zero weeks of uh, reserves as of right now. The only reason why people are getting their unemployment uh, insurance uh, payments is because the federal is in a similar state. Uh, many other states are, you know, either one week or two weeks or, or just a few weeks away from going broke with the massive unemployment in their unemployment compensation funds. So California is the leader in uh, fiscal uh, uh, lack of discipline, but it's certainly not the only one. And with the uh, economic disaster that has been uh, foisted upon us by the government's response to the coronavirus, probably just about every state is going to be in the same boat at some point uh, as far as having uh, a un totally unbalanceable budget. Uh, and every state will go hat in hand to the federal government. Uh, Governor Newsom has been saying nice things about Trump in order to make sure that California gets its, you know, gets its uh, hand out. All the other governor, you know, many of the other governors will do the same thing. Uh, and the only way the federal government can help the states is by printing up the money and they're more than happy to do so. Yeah, and well, yeah. this notion of California kissing up to Trump to get their money is kind of ironic considering Governor Newsom just said that the three counties that opened up against his orders now might not get their disaster aid. So I just, it's, I find the, the hypocrisy just just another bout of hypocrisy. Just yeah, I mean, I mean when, when you see, like in Michigan, when we see the governor of Michigan saying that you cannot buy garden seed. Uh, that's not about your health. That's about her wielding power with uh, no limit. And there's many other examples of governors and mayors and county administrators and the like uh, using the coronavirus to do a whole lot of arbitrary and uh, to basically tyrannical things, essentially martial law is what we have, uh, that they were never able to be get, uh, get by with under normal circumstances. Yeah, we're yeah. being governed by an executive order now, essentially. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And there, there's nothing constitutional or anything else that's good about that. Now, should we be uh, following the uh, common sense guidelines to prevent the spread of the coronavirus? Of course we should. I maintain social distancing. I wear 
uh, a mask when uh, I'm in the presence of somebody else that uh, is, is particularly concerned. Uh, and, you know, all of those things are, are common sense, good things to do. Should we be forced to do it under pain of being thrown into cl close proximity to other uh, people who may have the coronavirus in a jail? I think that kind of defeats the purpose of the whole thing. Yeah, I think that's the point where we've got to talk about is, is if it's, uh, is these, all these things are a good thing to do, smart to do and all that, but are we willing to throw people in a cage? We're willing to point a gun at someone saying, get in the cage because you didn't do what I thought you should do. That's, I know we don't think about that part of it. We think about, oh, we should social distance. We should wear a mask. We should do all these things. And okay. But should we point a gun at somebody and force them in a cage over it? And I think that's one of the parts we don't ever think about anymore. And then the larger question is, we don't think, you know, our politicians are not going to, and, and the people in general, 80% of the people, something like that, support all of the uh, lockdown. But we're not thinking about the trade-offs. The trade-offs are how many people will die from the coronavirus. And I don't know what the number is now, 70, 80,000, something like that, compared to about 60,000 in a normal bad flu season, compared to the number of people who will die as an indirect result of the, uh, of the economic uh, shutdown. People who have small businesses that fail and commit suicide. People who are forced into close proximity with uh, family members who are dangerous and die because of uh, domestic violence. Uh, people who uh, can't stand all of the, uh, the stress and the pressure and succumb to using uh, uh, heroin or, or other uh, deadly drugs. There's a whole lot of who, who are, fall through the cracks as far as the social welfare system is concerned, can't work, can't get a job, uh, and end up, uh, you know, not, not having a, a, a diet that will sustain them over the long run. Those are all people who will die or can die as a result of the, of, of the economic shutdown. Is that number larger than the number of people that we're saving through the shutdown? That's a question that politicians simply and the government, CDC, uh, FDA, so they're not asking that question. They're not considering what the trade-offs are. And if you don't consider the trade-off, you're not, you're malgoverning and that's what's happening. Yeah, I think I read um, this week, 79,000 people are expected to lose their lives due to suicides over the next six, nine months due to the shutdown, the economic shutdown and the, and the added stress. And then you talk about worldwide, 260,000 people by the end of the year into starvation might die just from starvation around the world. And that gets into the 200 millions when you're talking about next year because of the economic, the condition, the the conditions that the economic shutdown will create, the disruption to the supply chains. And you're talking about the, the poorest of the poor people here in the world, the sub-Saharan Africa and, and deep into the Indian continent. You're not talking about us Westerners aren't going to starve. No, we'll still be able to buy our food. Well, yes and no. I mean, already we're seeing uh, a large percentage of the packing plants, meat packing plants, being shut down because of infection uh, of uh, uh, Smithfield Foods in, South, in uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, among them. These are huge plants, and there's only uh, two or three uh, meat packing plants that run that do all of the meat packing, all of your bacon, all of your hamburger, all of your steaks. Uh, all of your chicken go through it, about two or three or four different companies. I forget the exact number. It's essentially an oligopoly. The reason it's an oligopoly is because the federal government has set up a regulatory standards that make it nigh impossible for all of the requirements. Only the big guys can do all of the, uh, can follow all of the safety and, and health and so forth requirements. So you end up with uh, a, a monopoly in the supply chain once that monopoly, once those monopoly players are shut down, you have no supply chain. So you say that there's not going to be a problem with uh, hunger in the United States. I'm getting kind of hungry for meat, just thinking about uh, get my supply of bacon. Yeah, that's and that's a hard thing to understand because, and also we'll get back to the California budget disaster. Elon Musk, I think today said he wants to pull Tesla out of California because of the shutdown and the regulatory issues he's facing. So we're you know, the long-term consequences of this are not easily calculated. And I don't think our government officials are even attempting to make these external calculations. It's they've become, what was it, the phrase we used earlier in the, I was using earlier, they become target focused, like a fighter pilot that becomes so focused on the target, he loses situational awareness. And he, yeah. actually becomes, he becomes danger, not just to him, to his, to his squadron and 
and it, to himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Target focus. Uh, no situational. That's that's a very good analogy, uh, and that's happening, and uh, it will continue to happen as long as we have the willingness to give essentially unilateral authority to one person, the mayor or the governor or the president, depending on the jurisdiction. Yeah, I think that's really what's dangerous is how quickly so many of us have been willing to um, just hand over power to one person, please save me, when we know through history that that one person, the likelihood that that one single person is going to have the right answer is essentially zero. Yeah, and, and even if it's not just one person, even if it's the entire Congress, is there a better chance that 525 or whatever it is people will have the right answer I, than, than millions of people across the country? I don't think so. Yeah, they can't solve the simple problem. They can't solve how to put fix potholes, and yet we're expecting them to solve, you know, this mass health health issue. It, it's absurd on its face. But that's about absurd on its face. That this looming debt and monetary policy crisis disaster. I know you were interested in really talking about how the long-term effects of this monetary policy, what is the effect of, what is it, $7 trillion debt just for this coronavirus, I think is where we're kind of approaching something like yeah, that? Yeah, seven to ten, you know, five to 10, somewhere in that range. Nobody knows for sure because it's it's fluid. It changes every every day, you know, depending upon whether uh, Chairman uh, of the Federal Reserve, uh, uh, Powell, is having a good morning uh, or had a fight with his wife, I think. I, I'm not sure exactly, but uh, the, the, the problem is, is that we have created a supply chain shutdown with the, with the, with the coronavirus shutdown. Uh, well over half of small businesses are shut down. Many of them will never be able to go back into business again because they don't have the financial reserves to stay in business. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the giants, the Walmarts and the Amazons and the Targets, they'll survive. They'll do just fine. They'll probably show a financial year-over-year -year gains compared to last year simply because they're getting all of the business that would have otherwise gone to neighborhood uh, grocery stores and and uh, and drug stores and and uh, uh, the other kind and and the, and, the, and the retail outlets that are now actually shut down like clothing stores uh, but the, but the small businesses won't and small business is a huge part of our economy so you've got a you've got a self-induced or I should say government induced shutdown of the economy with a very slow process for getting that back on track that's creating a supply shutdown or a supply shortage of goods and services. If you want to buy, like you know, we were talking earlier, if you want to buy meat in the very near future, already at Wendy's, it's not possible. You know, they've lost the hamburger that they need for their supply chain. I'm not sure what they're doing. Uh, I guess feeding people or serving chicken burgers or veggie burgers. I'm not really sure what they're doing, but you can't do that for very long before you before you know you have uh, uh, the price of meat skyrocketing. So you end up with a deflationary pressure uh, pressure on the one side, the government, the Federal Reserve and the and fiscal stimulus, they're trying to uh, prevent deflation by flooding the, the whole system, the monetary system and the financial system with, uh, with, with cash. That cash is going to Wall Street. You know, a part of it went to small business. We got our measly $1,200 checks. The vast majority of it went to the large corporations who took huge risks and should go bankrupt because they didn't uh, take care of making sure that they were able to to uh, they didn't have a rainy day fund. They didn't provide for the for uh, a disastrous future, and so they are going bankrupt, save for the government infusion of cash. So all of this money is coming into the eventually coming into Wall Street, or effectively coming into Wall Street. That's keeping the stock market up. I don't know if you watched the markets or not, but the markets took a huge dive from February to March. And now they're up about two thirds of the uh, distance that went down. The Nasdaq is actually at a new high, a new all time high. So Wall Street so far is doing fine. I don't suspect that it'll last too long, but right now it's doing just great because everybody is everybody in the, in the investment community is saying, "Don't fight the Fed." What's that doing? It's concentrating money even more so than it was before the coronavirus pandemic money is being concentrated in the the top one five or ten percent of the uh, of the public to the uh, exclusion of the bottom 90 95 percent the uh, the uh, social and political pressures on the on behalf of people who are not in that top 10 percent they're going to be pissed and they're like and then they should be pissed because they're the small business that they're working for was forced to close they have to go on the on 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 the dole in effect on, on unemployment or 
uh, food stamps, and, and the, the business that they were working for or, if they, or that they owned as a small business person has been forced to close and their business is being taken over by large corporations. Not a good, not a good, not a good situation. And and, and in the meantime, those large corporations, many of them, are being bailed out by by the Federal Reserve System and increasing the concentration of wealth uh, at the top tier, at the top of the pyramid. That's uh, a situation that's ripe for uh, social uh, revolution, if not uh, social uh, uh, demonstrations, uh, social breakdown. Yeah, I was. Uh reading an article the other day about how they're the feds now buying junk bonds yeah yeah and it's going well if you're going to buy junk bonds why don't you just take that money and give it to main street instead of wall street right why if you're going to buy worthless bonds and companies why are we giving it to, why aren't we giving it to these small businesses we forced to shut down why are we giving it to these to these large companies that are actually the ones only ones who are we're being allowed to operate it's, it's make it literally makes no sense uh, on what they're doing but yeah, well, we we're facing a supply crunch right now, but eventually uh, the supply crunch will meet the demand uh, increase, all of this new money flooding into Wall Street. Eventually, that's going to create a situation where there's way more dollars than there is supply uh, and prices will go up. It's called inflation and it's induced by the government, very directly induced by the government. People will blame it on wage spiral or price spiral or, or you know, or uh, some other you know nonsensical thing, but more money, same amount or less goods, prices go up, and when prices go up in the uh, in the face of people not being able to pay those prices, again you're going to have the uh, the ingredients for a social breakdown. Uh, so I mean you know I, I don't know how long out it'll be, and it's difficult to predict far very far into the future. Uh, as Yogi Berra said, the future is difficult to predict, especially when it's you know it's it's in the future. I, don't, I forget exactly, but uh, the point is we're going to have inflation at some point, and that's going to make things even uh, even more dire for a class divide, which is the thing that is uh, something that the socialists in in the in the political realm relish because it's their chance to step in and say we've got the solution to everything. Well, they don't. Uh, it's been proven in Zimbabwe. It's been proven in Venezuela. It's been proven in Argentina and every other country, uh, Eastern Europe uh, in the 50s and 60s. It's been proven everywhere that socialism is not the nirvana that it will be promised to be. But the, but the Bernie bros are not going to believe it. They're going to say, well, it's different this time. We'll be like Sweden, which isn't a socialist country, it's a capitalist country. Yeah, and in neighborhoods like mine where gentrification was already a huge issue and growing issue, where the, that class divide was already starting to create a neighborhood friction, it's just going to get bad quickly. And that's kind of our fear. We're already kind of starting to see and feel that tension here on, on the ground level in the streets. I don't know if other people in you know other neighborhoods that aren't as diverse or aren't as uh, pressured, under pressure, may not feel this. I think I'll feel it first. I'm kind of on the edge of neighborhoods. So I, I, I see what you're coming and you, you're right. It's hard to predict what the future holds, but you know, California is an innovative place. Our people are uh, resilient. And so you can hope that maybe we can find some way through despite what our government does, but it's, it's uh, tough to be optimistic. But the optimistic take on all of that is that once the currency breaks down, which it will, the currency will break down eventually. Uh, and what, once that happens, there's a whole lot of uh, innovation that can take place in the world of uh, actual honest money. Everything from gold to bitcoins to uh, you know out and out bartering. There's a whole lot of things that we can do once we get government out of the business of uh, controlling the supply and the price of money. Yeah, well, yeah, well, controlling the price of money, yeah, they've never been very good at it, have they? So why do we think they're going to be good at it in the future when they haven't been good at it in the past? I don't actually understand. But we've got a couple of minutes left, and we're talking about uh, disasters. The Libertarian Party convention is turning into a, at least a rhetorical disaster. We have no idea what it's actually going to turn out with. And maybe you've been following the actual mechanics of this better than I have. I've been kind of following the drama. So I yeah. Yeah, I, the only thing that I know uh, is that the LNC Libertarian National Committee will meet tomorrow, uh, Sunday the uh, uh, 10th, and determine when and how the convention will take place, whether it's going to be a virtual convention, whether it's going to be uh, a, a live convention, what the dates will be, whether it will be in Austin or a different venue. 
a whole lot of things to be decided by the LNC. Hopefully, they'll decide it tomorrow, uh, or at least get on a uh, a, uh, a glide path to a decision. Uh, once that's decided, I think it'll go on as scheduled. Uh, but what that decision will be, I have no idea what the LNC will will come up with tomorrow or in succeeding meetings. Yeah, I, 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 the passions are uh, quite high. I shall we will shall we say. There's uh, party leaders who are kind of, I won't say at each other's throats because we're kind of like that all the time anyway, but the toxicity level of the conversation is higher than I'm used to. You know, we always kind of bicker and argue with each other and you know, it's fine, it's kind of what we do, but there's a toxic, toxicity, I can speak today. There's a, to <laughs> there's a toxicity, uh, that word I'm trying to say to it. Lots of toxins in the room. <laughs> yeah, yes, there's a lot of, uh, vile and venom and, you know, kind of personal attitudes being thrown around. And that's the part of this thing I don't like to see. And I'm curious if maybe Justin Amash's late entrance into this thing is kind of as stirred the pot. And maybe it wouldn't be so bad if kind of Amash hadn't been such a late comer or if we'd had a real primary system. And so he yeah. couldn't. Well, the primary system aside, I mean, Amash certainly has annoyed the people who have been in the presidential race from the get go. Uh, they don't like. <laughs> the fact that he is entering the the, uh, the process at the last minute, and that's understandable. But he has every right to do that. There's no uh, rule within the uh, Libertarian Party that you have to campaign for two years, only that you have to get the most votes at the at the national convention. That's the way the structure is set up, and he's following all the rules as far as the structure is concerned. Yeah, there are people who are supporting uh, some of the other candidates who don't like that, and that's that's understandable. But that's just the way the cookie crumbles. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of the carpetbaggers myself, but, you know, it's, as a libertarian, you kind of have to accept the fact that we have to take a, the candidate that the public will most see as credible. Yeah, and, and somebody who can get media attention. Now, once Amash gets the nomination and once, or if he does, and once uh, the campaign gets underway, I will predict that that media attention uh, will probably disappear. Uh, in large part. There was a lot of media attention when uh, Gary Johnson was in the process of getting the nomination. There were a lot of networks at the uh, 2016 uh, convention uh, in New Orleans. But once he got the nomination, they all went away because the, the excitement and the, uh, the, the, you know, the news value of, a, of, a, of a, somebody who might upset the election kind of went away. Uh, and his support peaked at 10% uh, right, at, right after the convention and went downhill from there. Uh, whether, whether the uh, necessity to campaign mostly online uh, now compared to 2016 works in, in Amash's favor, that's yet to be, or, or whoever wins the nomination. Whether it works in the Libertarians' favor, that's yet to be seen. I think it may, but, uh, you know, the future is dangerous to predict. Uh, and on that, we're going to have to get out of here, Richard. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching The Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m., Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.